Well, uh, sorry for the rejecting of the papers. Uh, my, my, own, my own papers get rejected uh, at biological psychiatry, so, uh, so we're, we're, we're all in good company. Um, there we go. Uh, it's really a wonderful pleasure to be back with my friends in, in uh, Taiwan, and a pleasure also to follow Professor Casper's wonderful presentation on treatment-resistant depression. And um, today I, I'm going to be talking about uh, our work with ketamine, the work of the field with ketamine, and the recent uh, approval of S ketamine. So let's see. The lower one, the lower one. Yeah. Okay, that is good. All right. Um, the work that I'm going to be talking about today uh, is work from uh, several people, and I will certainly refer to some recent uh, ketamine studies from uh, Dr. Su's group here in Taiwan as well. Um, in terms of my financial disclosures, um, we have, I have a share of uh, patents for uh, ketamine treatment for depression um, that was licensed by Janssen uh, and uh, some equity in a, in a New Haven pharmaceutical company called Bio, Bio Haven Pharmaceuticals, which is uh, developing other drugs. So, um, as you've already heard, um, uh, it, we've recently had the very exciting development of the FDA approval of S-ketamine, the S-isomer of ketamine, for the treatment of uh, treatment-resistant depression or treatment-resistant symptoms of depression. Um, and this is really, in some ways, the first new, fundamentally new mechanism for the treatment of depression in decades. It's a very exciting development. But we have to be humble what we, about what we know as a field because uh, at the, nearly the same moment that we learned about the FDA approval of the treatment uh, of ketamine, S-ketamine, Allergan, a company that had been studying uh, a drug called Rapastinol, which stimulates rather than blocks NMDA glutamate receptors, Announced, oop, announced that all three of their studies failed to meet their endpoint. And so a drug that people had a great deal of hope for, rapastinil, um, is no longer in development. So I'll be talking about ketamine and S-ketamine today. So why did we think to test ketamine effects in depression? Um, in a way, th this work uh, began with a problem. And, and the problem was that the prevailing hypothesis in the 1990s and early uh, 1980s and 1990s, 1970s, I suppose, maybe ever since 1957 when uh, Kuhn and, uh, found that uh, uh, reuptake inhibition, monoamine reuptake inhibition was antidepressant, um, the, the prevailing hypothesis was that uh, that a deficit in, in serotonin produced depression. But when Dennis Charney and uh, others tried to cause healthy people to become depressed by depleting serotonin, we found that, that people didn't become depressed unless they were being treated with an SSRI, which we knew facilitated serotonin uh, signaling. Also, if people believe that norepinephrine deficits were a cause of depression, but when they gave uh, alpha-methylparatyrosine, AMPT, to block the synthesis of catecholamines, people didn't become depressed. And, and uh, Dr. Charney and his collaborators also heroically depleted serotonin and norepinephrine at the same time, and people did not become depressed. And uh, this was a real problem, <laughs> that it didn't seem, um, it didn't seem that, that uh, levels of monoamines in the body uh, were enough, depletion of those levels were enough to produce depression. So how, how could we understand that, um, that while uh, monoamine uh, uptake facilitation might enhance the treatment of depression, that depletion of these systems didn't cause depression in themselves. 
And the way we, well, our hypothesis was, was that the problem may not be in the, ser the monoamine neurons themselves, although monoamines are, are, are clearly affecting the brain, but maybe the pathology lives in the higher centers of the brain, in the cortex and the limbic system. And if depression lived in the cortex and the limbic system, as post-mortem studies uh, were beginning to show, that, that different neurotransmitters were involved in the biology of depression. And the, the main excitatory neurotransmitter of the cortex and the limbic system was glutamate. And the question of how would we probe glutamate, the glutamate system, in patients with depression. Well, it's, it so happened that I had been studying um, uh, glutamate signaling in people using ketamine, had been doing so for a long time, and we thought, well, why don't we see uh, the effects of ketamine in depression? And then we thought, well, when we give ketamine, uh, we don't know if people are going to have a, a good experience or a bad experience, so let's monitor them very carefully to make sure they're safe. We'll keep them in the clinic for a long time on their ketamine day, and we'll follow them very carefully to make sure nothing bad happens. So, so what we found was, yes, ketamine transiently makes people, uh, can produce a transient psychosis-like state or, and dissociative symptoms, it transiently produces euphoria. But ketamine is a very short-acting medication, and all of those effects are usually gone by about 120 minutes um, after the start of a 40-minute ketamine infusion. And then t time passes, and by two or three hours after this period, after the symptoms go away, and, and before we discharged people from the clinic, people began to say, I feel a little bit better, I feel a little bit lighter. And then the next day, when we called them to make sure nothing bad happened, instead of finding out that something bad had happened, some of the patients said, I feel all better, not just a little bit lighter, not just a little, uh, uh, not just a little bit uh, less depressed, all, all, all better. And we were really shocked by this. I think the field was shocked by this. Um, and so we were very pleased when other groups, uh, such as the first, the NIMH group, Zarati and, and, and uh, a group at NIMH, and then many groups around the world, as, you, as we've heard from Dr. Casper, and it's been replicated here um, in uh, Taiwan, that, that a high percentage of people who have treatment-resistant symptoms of depression turn out to respond to, uh, rapidly to ketamine. And one of the most fundamental early misconceptions about ketamine was that ketamine produces a euphoria that persists for many days. But healthy people do not have an improvement of mood or a persisting improvement of mood in ketamine. Most people who are healthy and get a dose of ketamine feel um, a little bit, what I, I would use the phrase, hungover the next day. In other words, that they have a headache, they don't feel their attention is not so focused, they often don't sleep that well after ketamine. So how can a drug that lasts only a, a few minutes, you know, 40 minutes or so after the end of the infusion, and where the if, acute intoxicating effects go away, long before any benefits emerge from a single dose. How can that produce um, an antidepressant effect that lasts for two weeks from a single dose in some cases? And what uh, Ron Duman and George Agajanian first showed was that in animals, one of the downstream consequences of, of ketamine is to regrow synaptic connections in the brain that are lost as a consequence of the detrimental effects of stress and inflammation and all the other negative processes that we associate with 
depression now in the brain. And so if you look at a dendrite, which is the input to nerve cells, you see these dendritic spines that are very common in healthy uh, neurons from healthy animals, that those dendrites, dendritic spines are greatly depleted in animals that have been stressed for a long time, and that those, those uh, dendritic spines um, uh, can rapidly regrow. This is the pointer. This is the pointer here. This is the, the pointer? This, this is the pointer. Okay. Sorry. Oh, yes. You see these modern technologies they have in Taiwan. I wish we had them. The spine grows. The sp right, exactly. I, um, uh, and, and so um, we can look for these same kinds of changes, enhancement in the synaptic connections of the brain. We can't do that um, very easily in people yet, but what we can do is l characterize, the, as Dr. Casper showed, the communication of, of uh, effective communication uh, in the brain of patients with depression using resting functional magnetic resonance imaging, where there are deficits in functional connectivity, and those deficits are attenuated um, uh, after ketamine. <clears throat> A large uh, consortium in the United States evaluated um, the dose-related effectiveness of ketamine. Oh, sorry. The dose-related effectiveness of ketamine in patients with depression, and they found something very similar to what Dr. Su here in Taiwan has found, which is that below 0 0.5 milligram per kilogram, ketamine is not very effective that 0 0.5 milligrams per kilogram, a dose that we selected to test in depression, not because we had an idea about what it would do in depressed patients, but because it was high enough to produce cognitive and behavioral effects in healthy subjects without making them so intoxicated that they couldn't complete the scales. But it turns out that at this level, ketamine is both um, quite active in the brain, um, but, it, uh, 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 but it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't produce anesthesia-like effects. Above 0 0.5 milligrams per kilogram, you get closer and closer to the levels of anesthesia. And as Professor Casper pointed out, at anesthesia levels, ketamine is not effective as an antidepressant because it, it shuts down uh, uh, too much brain activity. Whoops. I will, I will learn how to use these modern technologies very soon. All right, so um, one of the striking findings that was observed, not in our study, but in the subsequent studies, was that ketamine reduces suicidal agent, uh, ideation. And, and this is a, a nice randomized trial where people were administered midazolam and had a reduction in suicidal ideation, but you see <clears throat> that ketamine produced a much more robust reduction in, in suicidal ideation. Then if you took the people who received midazolam and then gave them a test dose of, of uh, ketamine, they dropped to the same level. And, and the point is that, that, um, that ketamine has powerful cognitive and behavioral effects, but uh, even when you use an active comparator like midazolam that, that produces very powerful sedation in, in, in the patients, uh, it's, you, you still see that ketamine is more effective. And for reasons that we don't quite understand, that the anti-suicide effects of ketamine seem to last much longer um, often than the anti-depression effects. Um, we know a lot more about ketamine around the United States and, and in, increasingly uh, in other parts of the world, the Canada in particular, uh, P Professor Blier has, has been treating uh, patients for a very long time with ketamine, um, that, that the rate of, of response in the clinic where placebo effects and drug effects work in your favor are additive, that, that the rate of response is shockingly high, about almost three-quarters of patients with treatment-resistant symptoms of depression seem to respond. 
There may be some positive interactions with cognitive behavioral therapy. It seems to be effective in people, many people who fail to respond to electroconvulsive therapy and other groups that traditionally don't respond well to medications, bipolar depression, psychotic depression, and, and others, as, as uh, Professor Casper me uh, mentioned. In our hands, it is not very effective for the OCD symptoms in patients with OCD, although it's helpful for treating their depression symptoms. Interestingly, other conditions like post-traumatic stress disorder, there are now data that are suggesting that it may be helpful for, for that disorder, and it's being intensively studied for that. Um, borderline personality disorder, it's being studied, other, other groups as well. Ketamine is likely to be the first of many different drugs that are being, are, are testing, undergoing testing now. Esketamine, which is the Janssen drug, which is approved. Rapacinol, which looked like it might <laughs> have promised, no longer does. But a, a variety of, of medications, including um, the R isomer of ketamine, which has been intensively studied by Professor Hashimoto in Japan hydroxynorketamine, which has been studied, a uh, metabolite of ketamine. Um, and some of these drugs act, uh, may have antidepressant effects other than by, by acting at sites other than NMDA glutamate receptors. It's not entirely clear. And then there are some gap NMDA glutamate receptor antagonists that are also being studied, nitrous oxide and, and xenon. So let's say, talk a little bit about esketamine. And, and um, esketamine, like uh, the racemic mixture of the R and the S isomers, seems to be, uh, have a, a standard a dose response. And one of the most interesting and important um, studies conducted by Janssen um, related to esketamine, um, and, and one of the reasons that it turned out to be, to, to be approved was that they did a study where they took people and randomized them to one of two groups. Either they um, started a new antidepressant and continued on, on uh, esketamine, or they st st uh, started a new antidepressant um, and, um, uh, and got placebo. And in that, in that study, the group that responded to the combination of the new antidepressant plus ketamine, who responded, then we're randomized to either stay on that antidepressant but stop the ketamine or stay on the antidepressant and continue the ketamine. As, as uh, Professor Casper noted, people who uh, tend to respond, who respond to treatment but don't remit necessarily have a high rate of relapse. So in, in the case of the, this combination study, 57.6 of people over a year who responded to the antidepressant but stopped taking their ketamine relapsed to depression. But the, the, um, the group that stayed on their new antidepressant and continued their ketamine had less than half of that, a 25.6% relapse rate. So what's really important and exciting about this is that if you compared, for example, duloxetine and fluoxetine to placebo in a very similar design, a drug discontinuation study. Over six months, the relative protection that antidepressants give over placebo is about 12%. Whereas here, over an entire year, the, the protection is about 25%. Or in other words, about double the protection against relapse. And in, in my clinical experience, and, and you, you're be interested in your thoughts about this, relapse is one of the most terrible problems that we face, and we don't talk enough about relapse as a, as a problem, because we can often get people better for a month or two, and then when they, when they relapse, it's demoralizing, it's discouraging, um, and oftentimes we're starting all over again trying to find effective treatment for them. So I think that this, in the long run, this may be one of the most important findings about esketamine. For those people who do respond, 
they have they tend to uh, be able to sustain benefit overall. Um, it, it's very well tolerated. The discontinuation rate over 48 weeks, 3.8 percent on people on on ketamine is not that different from the people who are only treated with antidepressant of 2.3 percent. Oop, and uh, let's see. The side effects overall are very well tolerated. Um, uh, ketamine is a little sedating. Uh, it, it can produce a little bit of anxiety, but it's generally very well tolerated. So what I've shown you is some evidence for things that I think you, you, you probably already know and are already being studied here in, in uh, Taipei, that ketamine is a rapid-acting antidepressant with high rates of response for treatment-resistant symptoms, a favorable safety and tolerability profile, that shows some efficacy for suicidal ideation and relapse prevention. Uh, we believe that it acts as an NMDA glutamate receptor antagonism, and the S isomer, which is more potent than the R isomer in blocking NMDA glutamate receptors, is, um, is the drug that was approved by the FDA. It activates local circuits and restores connectivity. Uh, this is one of the hypotheses. You know, if I had more time, I would say it not only increases them structurally, but it also makes synaptic, make, make synaptic communication more effective by shuttling uh, AMPA receptor subunits to the synapse and, and having other beneficial effects. And, um, and hopefully, ketamine is the first of several new treatments to come. Um, and there are, as people have begun to study how ketamine has worked, and worked out the various steps through which it works, each of those steps may be become a target for a new uh, antidepressant drug. For example, um, one of the things that ketamine does is to stimulate glutamate release. And there are drugs called mGluR2 receptor antagonists that stimulate glutamate release. And so people are studying mGluR2 receptor antagonists. And it's possible that hydroxynorketamine acts through mGluR by blocking mGluR2 receptors as well. We, we're not sure about that yet, but that, that may be one of the mechanisms through which it works. So the, this hopefully is, is, uh, will be a, a very exciting time for us as many new medications are being evaluated. So thank you.